Hey, welcome guys. Welcome everybody. This is Point Mind to Me, the wine business podcast. My name is Chaba. This is episode 11 and we're talking about inclusivity in wine. And today I asked Emma to join me, who is an accessibility consultant and also works in wine at the same time. We're going to discuss this topic, which is, I believe it's very important and it's not talked enough at least not in wine circles. That's how I feel anyway. And uh, yeah, let's talk about this just after the intro. Well, hello, Emma. Hi. Welcome. Thank you for accepting my invitation to this podcast. Uh, Thank you for bringing me on and giving me this opportunity to have a chat with you. Yes, let's let let's let's talk about inclusivity in wine. But before we go into that question, obviously mm-hmm. people probably want to know what is accessibility consultant. Yeah, what, no. What, what is it all about? What what do you do? Yeah, what do I what do I do? So I had a career before wine. I actually in my school days, which were a long time ago got the opportunity as work experience to go and work in a local special needs school and I very quickly fell in love with the idea of they had a unit for their sort of post-16 children and it was about teaching life skills it was about how are you actually going to access the world around you outside of this special school that's been adapted for you to learn in and and was about um, making that environment correct for them in that that school and it became very clear to me that it was something I really was passionate about was how you make the world accessible to someone who maybe have more additional needs than um, most people or they may not access information or the world in the same way. Um, So I ended up then working in special needs teaching and in special needs schools for 15 years and that led to me seeing a gap within accessibility Um, quite often when people were leaving education they had no support so I ended up working for people in their home setting up care teams working out how as they were coming into adulthood they were accessing places going to to restaurants all of those things getting into London and working with care teams around people who needed 24 hour care to access so it really opened my eyes to how much the world wasn't really accessible or things were missing. Yep. Um, whilst my children were young, it became a very big job. And I've always had an interest in wine and decided I needed to just take a step back um, from it as a full time career and fell into a wine ambassador job delivering wine tastings okay. locally to me. And I was incredibly fortunate to fall into a brand that supported me then to grow this massive experience in the wine industry over four years. So I did trade on and off, cellar door, hospitality, traveled to South Africa, did harvest out there, harvest here. And again, fell into this almost big career that I wasn't expecting, which is very fortunate. But it came quite apparent that there were bits missing about accessibility. And as you said, within the wine industry, there were some big gaps. And so for me, I thought, how can I combine the two? And that's where I've, I've turned that on itself and become an accessibility consultant focusing on the wine industry because they're strengths I feel I have to offer. Yeah. I mean, <clears throat> you just killed two of my questions immediately, but that's that. okay. <laughs> no, this, this, is, this is good. This is, this is, this is, this is, now. <laughs> no, no, this, this is good conversation anyway. I like these sort of things anyway. So that, that makes the whole podcast a little bit more fun as well yeah. and yeah we, we discussed you know how how you started in special needs school and and how you sort of started off in wine mm-hmm. do you want to talk a little bit more about the brand who i worked you for back then so the uh, yeah and i still support i still do ambassador work for them because it's really important because they gave me such a good base of understanding and mm-hmm. support my education in wine so it was really important to me not to lose that content so that's Benguela Cove in South Africa yep. so Benguela <clears throat> Cove is in in Walker Bay but they actually have a home here in the UK they own Lenersley Gardens and Manning's Heath Estate and their English wines 
they planted vineyards on those two sites in 2016 and their first harvest was 2020 and their first launch of the English wines will be in June this year. So oh, wow. I've been involved in the background in a few bits with them because they were a huge part of my journey. Penny Streeter, if you've not heard of her, incredible lady with a lot of, to offer. And she was really advocating, and I know we'll touch on this in inclusion, but she's huge for supporting those, especially women, to help further their careers, to help yeah. expose them. So she was instrumental for me being able to access the wine industry. So I absolutely still support them. I'm a huge fan of their wine <laughs> as well. That's good. That's good. Well, looking forward to taste taste the <laughs> non-English English wine. But well, it's uh, okay. of course, it's an English wine. But. Yeah. I know it's, oh. a, it's a funny old story when people say how did a South African wine brand end up in in the heart of Sussex and now they've got this English wine brand about to launch so but how, really... how, did, how did they end up in so Penny actually so she's actually from Zimbabwe but she grew up here with her children so she's got yeah. four children Penny actually has an OBE in her services to nursing and she set up a recruitment and that's where her background was and she moved to South Africa to set up the same profile she had here over there and ended up living on this vineyard, Benguela Cove. The gentleman said to her, I'd like to sell. Are you interested? And she said, oh, go on then. Penny had no idea what she was actually buying. And it was, I mean, Benguela Cove is 500 acres, 250 acres of vines. It makes over 250,000 bottles of wine a year. You know, it's sort of 500,000, I probably should say, actually. And so she then employed the services of Johan Fri, who is the winemaker. For, he was the winemaker for KWV, and he came over to Benguela and has yeah. turned it around. And they're award winning wines. And so, what Penny then did is thought, how can I get these wines into the UK? They need a home here so that they can be sung about here. And so she bought Manning's Heath Estate, which is a golf course. And for the golfers, upset the golfers and dug up half a golf course and planted vines there. So, but for anybody yeah. who loves wine, it was a great, great idea. And her son, Adam, runs uh, Leonardsley and Manning's Heath here with Barry yeah. Anderson, who Barry is a viviculture expert from South Africa, has 30 years behind him. And he's over here now bringing that experience to here. So it's just this huge entanglement of people yeah. with passion and love from South Africa and here, bringing them together. Probably a little bit less passion in golf. Um, <laughs> yeah, because... definitely, definitely. Not that the golfers, they're, you know, they're still yeah. very important. But yeah, the wine is definitely the driving force for, for that journey. Yeah, yeah. And what is, uh, well, let, let, let's move on a little bit because what, what is inclusivity? What, what inclusivity means? What, Obviously, people talk about inclusivity quite a lot nowadays, and it, it comes up in various conversations, obviously, race, gender, uh, sexual orientation, mm -hmm. loads of different things. Um, what would it mean in, in, in wine terms? Obviously, it's, it's not exactly in wine terms, but what, what does it mean? I think that's it. I mean, inclus inclusion in, in itself is the equal equal rights to all, and that's equal in, in, in making the, play the playing field equal. You know, if you have a set of stairs into a front door, then if you're in a wheelchair, you can't access it. If you put a ramp in, everyone can access it. Anyone can walk up a ramp, and then it's successful for a wheelchair. That's inclusion. It's looking at that, and how is it equal to everyone? How does that make it fair for everyone to access it? And that, for me, within the wine industry, especially in the UK, is such a, a young industry. It's it's a chance to teach right at those base roots what inclusion is and how you can be accessible. Be that language, attitude are your first two big things. So for me, I could really see, and it's very British to not ask questions. People tend to, when they don't know something or don't feel comfortable talking about something, they don't tend to ask lots of questions. And that's something I really strive for people to ask. Ask me, how can you be more accessible? Ask me what you can do, small changes, and you can suddenly make a huge change to a lot of people's lives. So one of the big things I'm calling on is quite often, especially in hospitality, when you now book tables, people ring up and they say, have you got any allergies? or dietary yeah. needs they're finding out that i'm asking for the hospitality industry to start asking have you got any access needs 
because quite often, you know, I turn, I was at actually I went for afternoon tea last week at the Shard, and I turned up and the the barriers they had to get through to get up to the lift were so thin. If I'd been in a wheelchair, I couldn't have got through them. And I said to them, you need to space them out more because you're already inaccessible. And I would have turned up in a wheelchair and not been able to get to you to tell you I actually can't get through. Yeah. So if we can ask the person, have you got any access needs before they arrive? We actually already start on an inclusion note because we've already included them in that conversation. They shouldn't yeah. have to tell us what they need. We should be hold, held accountable to include them in that conversation to open that door for them to let us know they may need something if I'm a wheelchair user and I don't need the chair at the table if I, you said if you've got any access needs and that chair's already gone when I arrive I feel included because that space is there for me yeah. I don't need the chair I arrive I say I don't need that chair you're pulling it out the way you suddenly feel like you're an inconvenience or something's not in not quite set up for you that yeah. that can be the world of difference between someone coming back to a place and not and I think for the wine industry as being such a Young industry at the moment in the UK, um, it's this time now to ask those questions for them to build it already in so we don't have to try and fix it later. Yes, it, it makes complete sense. And at the same time, uh, when, you, when you're not dealing with this sort of uh, issues, problems in your life on, on, a, on a daily basis, obviously it's very easy to forget. Yeah. And just before you know I, I sat down in front of the laptop to record this I, I was thinking am, am I the right person who actually can ask questions about this because I'm lucky enough I suppose that I don't have you know I don't have accessibility needs mm -hmm. I don't have you know food allergies so I'm so lucky mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and th these are the moments when you realize that you know for some people, it's not so not so easy, and I think uh, for me that that idea of me asking a question is, as you say, it's a very British thing. I'm not I'm not British, yeah. but um, no, it's, but it's still difficult, it's you know. Because we we're bought there's a part of us that's brought up not to question, you know, don't don't you know it sounds awful, but you used to say don't stare or don't look, and it's like actually yeah. do ask. Children ask all the time, what's going on? Why yeah. are they in a chair? What's what, you know, why can't they do this or how can they do that? And I think we need to learn from that generation. The younger that we stop asking, we need to ask. And like you said there, actually, it's a really good example. If you don't know any answers, how can you support them? Because actually, like you said, so many of us don't have to deal with those um, issues day in, day out. So we take for granted what we can access. Yeah. Uh, so by encouraging that question of what can I do to help do you have any access needs what can I do to help you still may not then be able to answer and say yeah oh yes we can accommodate that because of course there's going to be place you, you can't do everything and no one can do anything overnight as well but then that helps us learn what we may be able to do in the future yeah. so if someone comes to me and says oh do you have a braille menu the chances are no because it's a very niche market but actually if I can put together an audio, which is really popular, an audio menu and just have someone recorded, suddenly, again, it's more accessible. You know, there's just yeah. things that suddenly you think, well, what could I do that might be accessible? I can't necessarily answer. I can do it this time, but I might be able to yeah. do it next time. And that's where my accessibility consultant comes in, is coming into a particular hospitality settings, having worked in them myself and saying, what can I help you change? Or make more accessible do you often call them out or do you do you all, um, always call them been, out <laughs> yeah i have been in places where i've um, gone you can't do that or this is a great thing but i really try and as well because one of the things i push for is attitude like they're the asking the questions the yeah. can do attitude is i just try and go in with a positive attitude of what could you have done or what can i do to support you to make this yeah. better because I don't want someone else to have to go through this. So I don't want anyone else to see this. I definitely do feel that I will question people, but I want them to, I want to question them in a way that helps them learn, not question in a way it criticizes because, yeah. you know, that doesn't help anyone asking the wrong or giving the wrong impression to someone. Yeah. And, and also they're probably going to chuck you out immediately. <laughs> or, or pull try. Up. But anyway, yeah. <laughs>
But uh, on, on, a, on, a, on a more serious note, in terms of the wine industry, obviously uh, we, we talked about disabilities here, mm. but th- there are other parts as well, other group of people should should be included. And yeah. uh, when I when I talked about inclusivity in wine, I, I think I want to mention that as well. That obviously, as, as I mentioned in the beginning, race, gender, all, all the usual things. What people talk about in outside of the wine industry or in, mm-hmm. in, in, in a more general term. Yeah. I think in the wine industry as well, it's, I, I believe it's a problem. And I think there are some very good initiatives nowadays who, or which they try to tackle certain things. One of them is women in wine sort of collaborations and uh, certain groups. Um, and you are an ambassador or a mentor, I think. A yeah, mentor. Of, yeah, of, 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 of a, uh, another yeah. initiative. Do you, do you want to talk about that a little bit? As yeah, well? so that's set up by A.D. Smith, who himself is neurodiverse. His mission was to support people to access education and chances to write and work within the wine industry who are from different backgrounds so ethnic minorities like you said sexual orientation the probably less represented groups so that they can access those skill sets but also people who will mentor them on what their experiences are bring their expertise so actually I met with one of my mentees yesterday and had now a chat with him um and interestingly like his is his upbringing is is muslim so his parents don't believe in alcohol so how yeah. can he learn about it and feel inclusion within his family unit as well was yeah. a really interesting point we discussed yesterday so like you said it, that's a really good initiative and there's lots and inclusion is a massive umbrella because you're talking again about how do you make everyone feel equal on all levels that's the point is like you said women sex neurodiversity uh, disabled as in physically and all of those bits yeah. and pieces my concern is it's such a big brolly now different groups can get lost and different groups are, can be involved I think there's been a big push for sort of the sexuality and thinking about non you know non-gender toilets and things like this but sometimes actually other groups get lost behind and I think it's again that Everyone needs to be equal, so we need to be talking about everyone at the same time there. Yes, my specialty is accessibility for those with access needs, because that's what I've specialised in. But in that, you know, how many disabled toilets have you seen that ever have, and I like to call them accessible toilets, not disabled toilets, because they're accessible, but are male or female? They're not. The wheelchair sign hasn't got one with a dress on and one with a pair of shorts on. It's just a wheelchair with a person. So again, I go, well, accessible toilets are already gender neutral. So, you know, there's those things yeah. that cross over that we don't need to separate them off all the time. Sound like very minor things. Yeah. In, like in a in a general context, but when yeah. you talk about them, it just makes complete sense because, you know, how is that not a natural way of doing things? Yeah. I, it, it, it's such a strange way that's why I was a little bit worried about this conversation if I'm honest because I'm you know to say not the right word or use a wrong term or um you know these sort of things which I never even think about and Mm. uh, if if I can tell you something it's very funny because uh, again I was thinking about uh, what can I add to inclusivity in in a talk like this Mm -hmm. apart from you know asking very basic questions what connections do I have to all these things? And I was thinking about it for like almost for days, really. I'm I'm not joking. It's like no, no, no. I, because I'm I'm so lucky in in many ways that I'm I, I have no no disabilities. I, I as I said, I, I don't even have a food allergy. I mean, I'm, I don't know what's wrong with me in many ways. But anyway, <laughs> yeah, it's all the alcohol's killed all of it off. You're fine. <laughs> maybe maybe. But um, when when I thought about it. And I, just one moment, I was like, well, actually, language, because yep. English is not my first language. But maybe because I spent 15 years in the UK and I often joke that my English is a lot better than most English people's English. <laughs> you'll be, you'll be it in a proper format, which actually we're not taught. 
<laughs> yes, but it's it's you know it, it's that is that feeling uh, for me. Um, I, I I never felt it was a barrier, mm -hmm. but I, I can see that might be a barrier for some people to 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 join. Hundred percent. I mean, I mean, language is another one because you know I had a little boy and he was one of the ones that taught me so many lessons. He was autistic. He was five when I first knew him and used to babysit for him. He's now twenty five. I do get scared when I mention the ages of children <laughs> I've started with and. But yeah, he I remember sitting with him and he had a sandwich in front of him and I was said, have you finished? And he's going, no. And I'm going, OK, fine. So I left him and I went off and did my jobs and I came back and I went, have you finished? He went, no. I was like, OK, do you want any more? Oh, no, I don't want any more. Can I go then? And the difference in my language and the words I yeah. used changed his whole perspective yeah. of how yeah. he received that sentence. So like you said, be it language how we structure a sentence, be it a language, which is your first language. It's again, comes under that inclusion of what yeah. we can do to make a more positive environment for someone. Yes, yeah. yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not campaigning for, you know, Hungarian to be, you know, accepted in the wine industry in the UK, but uh, I think it's uh, it's, ta it's time for people to learn. Anyway, again, <laughs> jokes aside, in, in, a, in a great scale of things, mm -hmm. What do you think the the UK wine industry or the you or the wine industry in general? General. Uh, um, how is it when when it comes to inclusivity? I think it wants to open doors, and I think there's this feeling that they want to, but they just don't know how to. And I think it's showing that it's okay to ask questions and to use people that probably already in teams have additional needs have their own experiences like you said there there's an element for you that you don't feel you have anything but actually you do you've just said it like yeah. English isn't your first language so suddenly you have a strength in the fact that Hungarian is your first language so if you're in a setup where Hungarian is needed you become the strength so if you've got someone who is a wheelchair user, if you've got someone who has ADHD, autism, a visual impairment, a hearing impairment, bring them to the forefront and use their experiences to enable you to let the wine industry do more. We often, people will shy away with their disability because they see it sometimes as an inconvenience to who they may work for or a place they're visiting. But actually, if we encourage it, to come forward that's a huge strength that they've got to offer because it's something like you said there no one else has yeah. and I think that to me is within the wine industry I've met people I've spoken to people who who have sat the WSCT courses and struggled because they've got um, ADHD or dyslexia actually if they were to let people know that that can become a strength for them to support someone else going through it so that's that side of it and I think that's a really big push for the wine industry is actually there are people in it they can be using to their strength and then secondly is is a bit like we just said earlier it's getting people to ask questions it's okay as you said there a lot of people even when they talk to me are worried about saying the wrong thing and I would say nearly 95% of the people I've worked with would rather be asked the question in the wrong way to help educate someone than not be asked at all and have no education. Because if no one's asking questions, even if it's in the wrong format, they're not going to learn what the right format is to support someone. So that, to me, is encouraging the wine industry to ask those questions on how they can be more accessible. How can we help? What can we do? Or is this wrong? Or where is your need so that we can support them? Who who should be asking these questions? I mean, in terms of you know, uh, as a as a government body or as a governing body, or yeah. is, is is there any special place <laughs> where you can actually, I don't know, where, where you can actually, you know, go with these? So, yeah. So there's. So I've actually spoken to someone, they rang me and I've had a telephone conversation with someone within Scottish Accessibility, the council for the Scottish government, who wanted some input for what they were doing up there within, she works within the wine industry herself, and she reached out. So there are bodies within that. And for the UK, I'd like to see wine, you reach out and do some work with them. I'd love to visit 
and talk at London Wine Fair to be given those platforms. Yeah. And I think that like you said it needs to come from organised bodies like in this, I'm just thinking here because that's where I am. Yeah. Uh, start small and hopefully get it out there further. But you've yeah. got Wine GB, you've got a WSET school. And those are your two first you could get in and then London Wine Fair just to talk and help spread that message of what yeah. we're trying to achieve. Um, there are, like you said, there are brilliant voices, the likes of Queen Wong, through she also does Curious Vines, her newsletter. And she is superb at being a an advocate and supporter for giving voice for this. Yeah. But I hope that more and more people will help me sing sing this message out, really. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I mean, it, it's good to hear that somebody is actually asking you already. I mean, in mm-hmm. terms of, you know, when you mentioned the uh, the Scottish wine, what, what, what was the title? What was so the... She, is, she works for Equalities and Access in the Scottish Government, but she's okay. got a, she's actually worked, she does like her social communication for wine as well. So she's got okay. a keen head for wine. So she wanted yeah. to do talk how that works within the wine industry and hospitality so she could bring those bits to her job so that's what we yes. were discussing yeah it's great that they actually already asking yeah uh, do they listen when, <laughs> when, when, when that's my because obviously it, it's good starting point when, yeah. when they when they ask question do they listen do they actually implement things or try to implement things because i, I understand it's probably you know a very difficult things what we're talking about sometimes sometimes not but in in a on a governmental level or 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 a a governing body level Mm. it's probably quite difficult task to implement but do do they listen i do feel there's a i guess there's a difference between listening and action i feel i can be heard and i feel that a lot of i get a lot of lovely really supportive to feedback that your message is really good and you're raising lots of points and that's great I'm really pleased that that awareness is raising and that for me is at the moment that foremost for me is to get that awareness out there to help raise the questions actually in terms of change it takes time I know that nothing happens overnight and especially if you're making bigger movements of change and that's why for me those starting points of just getting trying to get people to ask questions that yeah. doesn't cost any money. That's just us having conversations. Yeah. I know that things that need investment will take more time. And I think for me, I'd like to almost revisit this in six months and see who's still who's still putting things into place and and who else is talking to me at that point. Because also, yeah, that that's it. I think it's 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 hard for me at the moment to measure what people are listening to rather actually like you said what they're actioning I almost want to send in secret shoppers send in people I know with their additional needs into places that have spoken to me and see how they've been different <laughs> yes I'm asking this question as well partly because um, let, let's go a little bit smaller than a, than a government yeah body or anything I've seen I don't know if it was an Instagram message or, or, or on, on your LinkedIn I can't remember but I saw I saw a post about the tasting where we met a couple of weeks ago, probably, I can't remember. Yeah. And you mentioned something about their acceptability yeah. issues there, which, again, when I was walking to that place, I, I walked down and obviously, again, for me, it meant nothing. I yeah. just walked, jumped across like three or four stairs, which, yeah. yes, looking back, that was a real issue. Did, did they listen? I, I specifically so, not mentioning the name yeah, of the yeah, exhibitors. Yeah, yeah. Or, you know. Interesting, I haven't had anything back, but I'm hoping that coming forward, when they've read something like that, they might say, have you visited this venue? Have you got any thoughts? Or, you know, so that they can yeah. learn from it. Because like you said, the piece of information I picked up, that actually the disability entrance was at the top of the road. Yeah. And you only read that when you got to the bottom and you couldn't actually get to the door to read the note yeah. anyway. If that had gone out, if that was me, you know, if, if there was a wheelchair user coming to that venue, in particular, just thinking of wheelchair, but that could be any, you can still get someone who's unsteady on their feet who's going to struggle with those steps or someone with a visual impairment. 
if that information was and I and to be fair to me I haven't looked deep dived into their website either yeah see if it's there if that was readily available you you're inclus you know that inclusion is higher as, as you said but now I haven't had any direct feedback I'm hoping subliminally they've taken <clears throat> it on and it's made a change for the future Whose responsibility is it in that case? Is that the venue or is that the event organizer? The or venue, you... the venue should have it there, but I would encourage anyone booking a venue to to ask those questions, and yeah. if they're booking it and inviting people to use the space to make that known, you know, the venue I worked in, most of the ve- the functions are upstairs and the lift was temperamental. So if you were booking a function and suddenly you turn up and you know you, you can't yeah. get up to it, how is that inclusive it's not and I used to encourage them if the lift wasn't working ring ring the main person who's booked it and just say just to let you know the lift's not working because if someone's coming with you who needs it it's not available at the moment let us know I'm not saying we can magic it to work but at least you're prepared when you turn up it's not a surprise so yeah it's that's that line again that communication can make a huge difference to someone's day of how they feel yeah Uh, I think in terms of Communication as well, it's a good point because although you're doing a great job and obviously I'm, I'm not going to pick on you in, in no, that I do, sense. Do, I don't mind. <laughs> but uh, it's, may, maybe you should have started your post with that because yeah. it was at the end of the post. I, I, I honestly don't remember whether it was Instagram or LinkedIn. I can't remember. It was on Instagram, yeah. Yeah. And it, well, it's even worse than in this case, because Instagram is a very visual platform and then you see the images and then a lot of times people don't really read because they just, okay, press it twice. You get a little like and they went on. If somebody takes the effort to read it, obviously they can realize it at the end. But maybe you should start with these ones in the future. I don't know. I'm just, just no, no, no. Definitely, no. It's been raised with me that a couple of friends through the Instagram world have said, you know, they think I should film like when I arrive at a venue and I can't get to the door, and how that might feel if I was wheelchair user. And it's definitely something I'm gonna bring in. I think for me at the moment as well, I'm treading a fine line for me, I guess, as well, of keeping an active audience so I can spread a message. And I think there's that fine line for me of not um, upsetting too many people too quickly that I don't actually get a clear message of what that inclusion could look like. But I do agree of actually bringing it to the forefront is important too so that it's the first thing you're talking about not the afterthought at the bottom and that's the important message long term no i, I don't get me wrong it, it wasn't a criticism it was i think it is important i think it is a really key thing but yeah it's that fine line between keeping an audience to just keep yes going I, I believe i believe most of your audience still goes to your instagram profile mainly for wine yes am i right i mean that's that's Um, probably the 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 the, the number one yeah the wine and the sign language that has been incredibly popular i get a lot of messages about that not only for those for understanding it for hospitality (laughs) and those who are teaching their children i'm I'm not sure you should be teaching them all the signs for wine but that's great if that's how you're (laughs) accessing it and you're then introducing a next generation into that inclusion message so that's great so that's a big thing is the sign language but again I don't want to get lost in just one part of accessibility when it's a bigger picture of how inclusion works and it's lovely that it's been visual as you said Instagram is usually visual so sign language really works on it and yeah I know I need to do more on LinkedIn that is a key thing that I'm rubbish at yeah I think from my you know my, from my digital marketing background, I, I would encourage you to go on LinkedIn because LinkedIn yeah. is, I think uh, you, you probably can reach a lot of very valuable contacts mm. there as yeah. well. And, and and the message is probably very well received on LinkedIn as well mm. as on Instagram. But uh, yeah, again, that that's just a sort of a side note. No, 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 uh, you're not the only one saying it. My husband, he, he's very active on LinkedIn because he's yeah. head of HR for a big company. So that's his big dig. And he always says, you should be putting this on here as well. And I go, I know I will I'll do it. So I do need to, because ultimately for me, like I said, 
foremost it is just raising awareness at the moment to support yeah. that message and then get that accessibility in place and I, if people are using it for good and change, then I want to support it. That's that's key for me. As you said, I don't have a physical disability that disables me from being able to access anything. My big thing is I'm allergic to fairy animals. So when people say they're dog friendly, I'm like, great, I'm not going. <laughs> trap me. You know, and like people yeah. go, it's great when they're dog friendly. I'm going, is it great? I just, you know, but yeah, it, to me, that message of how we can be more accessible needs to be louder and louder and the, all the platforms I should be using yeah. to spread that. And how can the wine industry be, you know, actually a bit more inclusive? Because that's that's my last question. Obviously, yeah. you know, we, we, we mainly covered it, but... Uh... Yeah. No, no, it is, like you said, I think that comes back to that question. It comes back to, I call on the hospitality and wine industry to be asking have you got any access needs? Have you got them? So that it can enable people to access it, full stop. Yeah. You don't, you know, vineyards are a beautiful place. They're really accessible. So why aren't we getting more yeah. people in them? They, yeah. you know, they are rows of vines normally downhill. You know, they're just accessible. I mean, there's this beautiful picture. And off the top of my head, I can't remember the name. He's a huge advocate for... He actually, his disability came later in life. So he had that experience of accessing the world on his feet and now is in a wheelchair. And yeah. he's a, a sommelier and he loves harvest. Oh, yes. He can just wheel himself down the vines and pick the grapes, you know, and there's so much we can. So I think just asking those questions and there's so many opportunities to enable people to be involved that if you ask, do you have any access needs? then suddenly yeah. these people are going to come in the door. If I'm honest, when, when I saw AD's initiative, and for a while I was like, where is Emma? Where is Emma? <laughs> I, it, it, it was because it, 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 it was almost on a daily basis, some yeah. influencer come up and, you know, I'm, I'm a mentor now, I'm a mentor now. And, and I was like, I do hope they're going to ask you to be a mentor yeah. because... <laughs> obviously it, it was very suitable for you and, yeah. I, and i understand that, that initiative is not necessarily or not just about physical disabilities or these sort of things but yeah i, I was very pleased when i saw your little video pop up <laughs> on that on thank that you i think i think that's the other thing is it was interesting when we were talking about this the mentorship i was talking about someone when when we first sort of banding about and being asked to be part of it and how that was going to work. And it was really interesting talking to this guy yesterday, but actually getting into schools, because the wine industry is wine, mm. you obviously don't um, really teach it very much at school because obviously they can't drink wine, but actually the viviculture and, and business side of it is key. And mm. that inclusion in the door of actually hitting a wider market I'm talking actually in our because I'm based in a school some of the time during the week as my yeah. as an as a learning coach I'm talking to some of the children at the moment because actually it's a great career to get into but we're we don't talk about it till they're older so actually you yeah. miss out maybe a section of children like children with different diverse needs who would access it that's a whole nother area I keep thinking that needs more tapping into as well <laughs> I think you're going to be very busy in the in the yeah. near future if if things go like this. My oh, husband says I'm rubbish at it. I can't sit still. <laughs> on on that note, really, what what is your what do you want to do? What what's the what's the future for you? Because that's yeah. my you know that that's the other question. Obviously, you are in wine. You still work in school, but you you must have a a goal where you want to go and and, and want to do stuff. Or business, yeah. something to do with this, I, I believe. Yeah, exactly that. So it's definitely something when I, this time last year, said to myself, I need to combine these two. The, I can see these gaps and I want to help. I want to help bring the wine industry into that inclusivity space and make sure that we're accessible to all. And as you said, I'm in the school by day because at the moment, unfortunately for me, there's not a... a, a a pay for me to pull from that because I'm building that awareness and yeah. building that support I think long term I'd love to be I mean someone suggested to me that it almost needs to be like a Emma sticker 
like the Michelin star or your food hygiene that you have in the window, that there's yeah. an M sticker that says we're accessible or we've done inclusion training awareness so that our whole team is aware of what needs you may have coming in the door and we're going to ask you those questions. And I think that's a really lovely thing. And I'm actually meeting with a, a wine distributor who deal with quite a few bits and pieces and I'm doing some training for their in-house team. And that's it, is that awareness of inclusion and what that looks like so that they can become more accessible to those wanting to work in it or those guests who come to you. I yeah. think that's it. So I think long-term being able to offer that level of training would be really lovely and how that looks is a growing platform. <laughs> yes, yeah, so I, I assume you need you, you would need some sort of sponsorship or some sort of a, I don't know, some sort of funding to, mm. to actually yeah. make this big and, 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 and make it, you know, viable for yeah. not just for yourself, but for businesses as well at yeah. the same time. Yeah, it's, exactly. That's obviously, as, as we know, the, the, the hospitality industry is certainly not, but the wine industry isn't either the place where, where money just flows constantly. No, exactly. So I think it's it's another element of what you have to consider. I but, think that from that point of view, oh, sorry, I'm just jumping in. Yeah. I think from that point of view, if I can offer training on a really lovely little level that allows everyone to understand it better imagine then the clientele you're missing i mean a quarter of an a quarter of the population has a recognized disability yeah so if you become more accessible imagine how many more people could come through your door as a wine industry or as a hospitality industry to access it so the little bit of an investment in some training for your team could make a huge impact for who actually is accessing and bringing in your revenue that's yeah. just a, a side of that thought no, process no. It's true. It's true. And then, if you consider, if you if you just take the language part, mm. which I'm suffering from, but uh, you know, it's like hospitality industry. At least before Brexit, it was completely well, probably ninety percent foreigners. In, yeah, in, definitely. In, in, that that might be an issue as well. But uh, yeah, you know, for my uh, language barriers here, because that really isn't a barrier. But uh, but like, it is. There is though. That's that's your experience of the world that gives you an understanding of how that may feel for you. Therefore, you can break that down to someone else's barrier. And that's like you said, if you feel more included from a language point of view, that's your inclusion tick. Yeah. So it's breaking down those barriers. What is the, I don't like to use this word, but soft skills people need to, to understand this topic in general. I, 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 can, I can only think of empathy yeah as as I a major yeah 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 no there is empathy and i think the ability just to listen and not see it as criticism yeah so like you said there if someone wants to give you feedback take it from a positivity that they want to help you grow don't look at it as a criticism that they're saying you don't do this yeah actually you could do this is a really different way of looking yeah. at it so how you listen and take that positivity from what someone's got to offer is a really important thing. We all need to develop all these soft skills a little bit more. But I think, I certainly think there is hope. Yes. I, I, I hope there is hope. Well, because... yeah, yeah. I think I look at, I've got 20 plus years now within the disability sector and working in it and supporting it. And as much as it hasn't changed as quickly as one would like who's worked in it, it's made big strides. And how we deal with mental health is making huge strides at the moment. So it is a changing, changing scenery. And like you said, so it is coming. They do make changes and people are more willing to listen. So I hope that continues. Maybe we need more of you. What do you think? <laughs> I mean, it's just because, you know, we, we, we I think, uh, I I like to think that we are, especially the wine industry. Mm. I like to think that we are open-minded people. I like to think that we are, you know, we we have empathy mm -hmm. towards each other. But maybe we need the message. We need to hear the message more often. And uh, yeah, more people. Uh, definitely, and I think conversations like I've been fortunate with you this evening to have is exactly that people talking about it 
is where it needs to start. Like you said, the wine industry coming up is really important. I think there is a slightly older, maybe generational wine industry that has had those barriers in the past and, and on accessibility on all levels, be it gender, yeah. race or sex as well. But like you said, it is open to learn. And that's that key thing is if we can keep those doors open and those conversations happening, change will happen. It, it, has, it does because it becomes natural and it becomes part of life. If we stop the conversations, then we fall back into old habits. And I think that's that important message to keep going with. Yeah. yeah. Well, brilliant, Emma. Thank you very much. I think it was a, it's a very nice, very nice ending sentence there to what you just delivered uh, on this topic, because I think it's a, yeah, I think, I think it's, a, it's an important topic. And, uh, and I do think that in the wine industry, we don't talk about it enough. No. And, and, and even very small things, what you just put down in that Instagram post. And mm-hmm. when I thought about it, you know, I didn't think about it when I was walking to that door. And when I read that message, I was like, God, I mean, I don't have to, I, I, I don't have to deal with a wheelchair on those mm-hmm. tiny roads, staircase, whatever. But if they turn me around and say the entrance is from the other side, mm-hmm. walk back there, I would be pissed off myself. Yeah. And I was like, that that's just the, you know, and the, weather, the, and the, the millennial in me. Because, yes, okay. you know, and at that point as well, on that particular day, the weather was nice. Yeah, Imagine exactly. if you're in the rain, the snow, yeah. the ice, yeah. and you've, you've got that far as well. Yeah, there's lots. There's lots of bits that can make a huge difference to someone's day. So I, th- I think we need that message amplified a little bit. So I, I'll try to help. Uh, make, hopefully this episode will, 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 will go a little bit further than my previous episodes. And also, you know, thank you for all, all the work what you do because oh. essentially you're doing a, a very good and a very important job. And, and I, I, I hope you can continue this. Thank you. No, um, so I'll, this week, so I'll let you know how they go and I might put them at the yeah. forefront of their accessibilities. Maybe I'll film it as I go in. Brilliant. <laughs> and and put it on LinkedIn. Yeah, listen, exactly. listen to your husband. Yes. <laughs> listen to your husband. <laughs> but anyway, uh, Emma, thank you very much. And thank guys, Thank you very much for uh, watching. Uh, if you're still with us, please press the little subscribe button down there, and the like button, the share button, every button what you can press, press it. And uh, yeah, we'll talk about other things later. Bye. Cheers. Bye. <laughs>